Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you. And are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him. 
Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Um, when, I had to, when I read through the Bible, front to back, when I read through the Gospels, it's an interesting experience reading the Gospels in order. Because it's most of the same stories, most of the same parables, but taught from, written from four different perspectives. And it's a really, it's a really beneficial way to learn the Gospels and to really understand what was going on in these stories. Because most of them occur in more than one Gospel. You can read the story two, three, sometimes four times from four different perspectives. But when I was reading through the Gospels, I found it, I, I laughed. I, I found myself laughing out loud at the Bible sometimes because the disciples just didn't get it. You know what I mean? Like, they were really simple guys. Jesus would say something, like, oh, yeah. And then he would have to say, it says here, that Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Like, you guys don't get it. I'll speak in plain English here for you. I just, I'm just So, I digress. In verse 15, And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go again. Then Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with you. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting at the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. She had great faith, did she not? Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She knew through the word of the prophets and even through the word of what Jesus had said up to this point that he has promised that at that last day, he will resurrect, you know, the saints that, that have died. And that's what she was referring to. But he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe. And you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. She waited for him to call her by name. If you go back, and this is not at all part of my message, but if you go back um, to verse 20, then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she got up and ran to meet him. But Mary remained seated at the house. She knew he was coming, but she didn't go anywhere. She waited, it says. Let me find this again. In verse 28, the teacher has come and is calling for you. She waited for Jesus to call her by name. Until she went to see him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. How many times do you think that those two girls said that to each other in those four days that they were waiting for Jesus? The first thing they both said to him was the exact same phrase, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. How many times do you think they said that to each other? Therefore, verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Now this is super interesting. Again, this is not really direct, the direction that I'm going, but there's 20 uses of the word groan in the Bible now. The Hebrew and Greek texts are funny because there's 20 uses of the word groan, but I think there's 9 or 10 different meanings to that one English word. And in this chapter, this word is used twice in these couple verses. And he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. This word for groaning here in the Greek actually means to have indignation on or to speak with anger or annoyance provoked by what is perceived to be wrong. Jesus was not happy. He was angry. He was speaking with indignation. 
there's many reasons why, and I'm not going to get into that. Again, I said that, that this isn't really part of my message. But that's just interesting that Jesus, we have to remember that when Jesus came and got off his throne and came down and was birthed into this world as a human being, he felt all the things that we feel. You know, it says that Jesus was tempted in every way. Same as us, but he did not sin. That's why we can approach his, his throne of grace, because he's not just this high priest, but he actually knows what he feels. Jesus felt anger here. Jesus felt sad. That is another message for another time, so I'm just going to take a sip of water. <clears throat> Moving on. Verse 34, and he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Verse 38. Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. That verse is very important for where we're going. It's verse 39. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Everything Jesus did on this earth was for the glory of Absolutely everything. He was intentional with everything he did and said. And it was all for the word of God. Now when he said these things, he cried with a loud voice. He didn't whisper it or just walk over to this tomb and say, you know, come on up. He spoke with authority and said, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came up bound hand and foot with grave cloths. And his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. That's where we're going to stop for today. We're going to go back and we're going to kind of dissect this passage of scripture. This is John chapter 11 from verse 1 to 44. We're going to see what Jesus really did in this story, how he did it, why he did it, and how he wants to do this in our lives as well. The story is much more than the resurrection of Lazarus. This story really doesn't even have much to do with Lazarus. And we're about to see that. So if you look at verse 3, in the New King James Version it says, Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now, they lived in Bethany, which is in Judea, and Jesus was on the other side of the Jordan River. This is about a day's journey. I'm not exactly sure. I think it's about 20 or 25 kilometers. But it's, it's a day's journey. He was out there on the other side of the Jordan um, where John the Baptist was originally baptizing people. He was there because previously in John chapter 10, uh, he had to escape from uh, the people who were trying to stone him. It says in verse 39, John chapter 10, that he escaped out of their hand. Like he literally had to escape from these people. They were going to kill him. So he was hiding for lack of a better term, on the other side of the Jordan River. So they sent to him and says, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now, if this was me, and my brother was sick, you know, like a pretty serious illness, and the journey for me to send a message, you know, I, Martha didn't text Jesus, you know what I mean? She didn't send him an email or give him a phone call. She had to send us a message, a day's journey. So if I'm sitting here thinking, my brother's sick, it's going to take a message for this, or a day for this message to get to Jesus. If he were to come as soon as he got the message, that would take another day. So we're talking two days. I would say, my brother's really sick. Can you please come here and heal him? Would anyone else send a message along those lines, or would they just say, he whom you love is sick? If I knew Jesus personally, if I was in this situation, and I saw him in his ministry, and saw the healings that he performed, saw the always he was capable, all that he was capable of, I listened to his word, Mary listened to the word of Jesus at his feet, I would say, can you please come heal my brother? 
that she didn't ask him for anything. She, these two women had an incredible amount of faith. And they knew that Jesus knew exactly what they needed. They had absolutely no doubt that he knew what they needed when they needed it. And although what Paul wrote in the Philippians, he said, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Although that hadn't been written yet, they knew that about Jesus. They knew that he was God and that he would supply their every need. And that he was faithful. So they didn't ask. They just said he's sick. So this is important in our own lives. It's written in Matthew 6, verse 8. That for your father knows the things you have need of before you even ask him. Does anyone believe that in this room today? That Jesus knows exactly what you need, when you need it, even if you don't know what you need. And if you do know what you need and you happen to ask him, that he knew long before that time. So, we move on to verse 5 and 6 here. And it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Now Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus, so he got on a donkey, or he strapped up his sandals, and he sprinted as fast as he could to Bethany. Now, he loved them so much, so he just stayed for a couple more days. Isn't that interesting? You would think that what they needed was for Jesus to come heal Lazarus, but he knew what they needed, so he <coughs> stayed because he loved them. You know, God doesn't always work in our time frame. Or on our schedule, and I learned that, I think, the hard way. I'm still learning that. There's a story that I've told here before when I was teaching on the Holy Spirit about a woman, when we were on outreach in Africa, it was a day of prayer and fasting, so we were really expecting, we, we, we dedicate the whole day to fasting and prayer, and uh, just wanting to see the Lord move. So this lady came into the church where we were praying, and she was possessed by, um, by, by something of the devil. Um, and we prayed, we prayed for her for over an hour, at least, probably close to an hour and a half. And we prayed for her, and and uh, and whenever we prayed for deliverance for someone, we would we wouldn't help them get up off the floor. They would always end up. We wouldn't help them get off the floor. We would say, in Jesus' name, arise. And it, it took a long time for that lady to respond to me, in Jesus' name, arise. So I wasn't convinced. I don't think other people were convinced that she was fully delivered. But in my mind, you know, I would think, she came here. We just prayed for an hour and a half. I think God, God's got to deliver this woman because I'm tired. She needs it. No, she got up. And she was it, was, it was apparent that she had not been fully delivered. And some would question, even myself, I probably questioned why, like what more do we have to do, what else do we have to say, Don't, can't you see that this is what this woman needs? So she got up, and, and, and she was still physically possessed by, by this thing, and, and she started wandering off into the jungle, and so we followed her because we thought that was a good idea. And, uh, and she... She said, our house is just there. And if you're ever in Africa and someone tells you that something is just there, it's not just there, it's like there. You know what I mean? Like it, We didn't have a lot of time to spend with that woman, but she took us on a journey that was probably about an hour long through the jungle and we finally got to her house. And long, long, story of it is, long and short of it is, um, we prayed for her at her house, we prayed for her husband, her children. We uprooted, um, the, the Lord gave us a word and we uprooted something that they had buried on their property uh, from a witch doctor, dedicated their land to a witch doctor. Her whole family got saved at her house. 
And see, the Lord knew the need. Right? She didn't come just to that church for her. She probably did in her mind. But her steps were ordered of the Lord to get to that house, to get our attention, so we could go back to her house, and so her whole family could be saved. Her land could be rededicated to the Lord. And her life was forever changed. We saw her a week later on the other side of the village. We're talking from her house probably like a two-hour walk, and this lady was elderly. A two-hour walk, and she was at one of our crusades, and she just showed up full of the joy of the Lord. Her life is forever changed. Because the Lord knew her need. And he didn't necessarily work in what we thought was the best timing. But he knew the need, right? So let's do some math here. Earlier I talked about how far Bethany was from where Jesus was. So to send a message, that was one day. Then it says Jesus stayed for two more days. So that's three days. And then for him to travel from where he was back to Bethany, that's four days. Okay? Now this is really important, because back then, the Jews had this idea that if somebody died for three days, the soul would remain, you know, I tried to study this, and I didn't really get it, but it said that the, the soul of the person would kind of remain around the body, and or in the body, and if they were to rise up in those three days, that would just be called kind of like a near-death experience. And it was common. You know, so they do it three days. But the fourth day is when de decomposition of the body begins. And then the fourth day comes and this person hasn't risen and they're dead. Their soul is gone and they're dead. Do we see why it was important that Jesus waited for four days? He could have gone when he got the message, got there and healed him. Well, actually he couldn't have because... Said it, with, he, it said, you know, when they got there that he had been dead for four days. So he actually died the day that she sent the message. But anyways, he could have healed Lazarus. And people would have thought, Jesus healed another person. Praise God. You know what I mean? But Jesus waited for four days until the Jews were absolutely convinced that this man was dead. And then Jesus comes in and raises him out of the grave. And it says, if you look on further in John chapter 11, verse 45, it says, Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believe in him. Many of the Jews. This has got to be a lot of people. You know, the, the mourning process for a Jew who died was pretty extensive. It was, uh, it was about 30 days long, but for the first most of the, of the village or most of the surrounding area would come and mourn with these people. So there was a lot of people there with Mary and Martha mourning over the death, of, the death of Lazarus and they saw Jesus raise him from the dead and their lives were forever changed. This is all for the glory of God. Do you see it? Do you see it? It's pretty apparent that Jesus sees the big picture. Is it not? We tend to have tunnel vision in our eyes and see what, what we think we need. But Jesus sees it all and he saw the greater need. The need wasn't for Lazarus to wake up and be alive and live the rest of his life. No, the need was for all these Jews to come and see Lazarus raised from the dead and believe in Christ. The need was for Mary and Martha's faith to be increased. The need was much greater than the life of Lazarus. You see that? Jesus said it himself in verse 15. He said, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. Mm -hmm. That you may believe. If he was there, he would have just healed him. He would have said, no, he would have just healed him. He's glad that he wasn't there. So that they would actually believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, just like he said. What's important in this story is um, the character of Mary, believe it or not. Um, 
Mary is mentioned three times. This story, there's a story in Luke chapter 10 and John chapter 12. She's mentioned three times in the Gospels. Every time she's found at the feet of Jesus. In Luke chapter 10, she sat at his feet and listened to him teach the word. In John chapter 11, where we're at, when she came and greeted him, she fell at his feet and poured out her, her sorrow and her pain. And in John chapter 12, you guys know that story, she anointed and washed the feet of Jesus. Every time Mary is mentioned in the Bible, she's found at the feet of Jesus. And that's really important because that's where this comes from. You know, whatever it is we think we need in our lives, or whatever it is that you need to see resurrected in your lives. Wherever you need to see Jesus move in your lives, it begins at the feet of Jesus. And that takes that takes a real spirit of humility. The word humble that's used in James uh, chapter 4 verse 10 where it says humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. That word, it's a Greek word, um, tapino, and it means to make or bring low. It literally means to bow down, to be lower than someone else, to be found at the feet of Jesus. And what does it say in Psalm chapter 10 verse 7? Lord, you have heard the desire. Or Lord, you have heard the cry of the humble. You see this? There's things in your life you know, Deanna, I can use you as an example. I, I wrote it in, in the card that we gave you on Thursday night. For those of you who aren't with us, Deanna shared her testimony on Thursday night. And, uh, and some of the things that Deanna has gone through are almost unfathomable to me. Not almost, they are unfathomable. But I, I wrote her card. The things that she's walked through the path that she's journeyed on has all been for her. That's right. That's right. But, I mean, it's not about you. It's for the glory of God. Deanna stood up here on Thursday night. And Jesus Christ was glorified in her story. How many lives has Deanna's story touched throughout her programming Teen Challenge? Nights like Thursday night, how many lives has her story touched? You can't count. Just like the Jews that were brought to faith because of what Jesus did. Who knows how many? That's the big picture. That's why we sing. That's why we teach. It's just all for the glory of God because He's worthy, is He not? Amen. He's worthy. Yes. And He's faithful to do it. I think that's all the Lord wants to say to us this morning. I have a little bit more I want to share, but I, I really believe that the Lord has, has touched some hearts this morning. Let's stand and let's pray.
Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your ministry on earth as a human, a human being. We can go back to and read in your word and study and learn from you. Thank you for the story in John chapter 11, the resurrection of Lazarus. But God, we thank you for the bigger story. Thank you that we have this opportunity, this life that you've given us, the gifts that you've given us. And you've called us to give it all back to you. And we thank you. You've called us to give it back to you. To bring glory and honor to your name. So that the whole world would know. The whole world would see your power. Your faithfulness. Your love. Us to live each day with that motive to bring glory and honor to your name. And absolutely everything that we say and do and think. May our heart's desire and our motives be to bring glory to the name of Jesus. see the bigger picture. When we're faced with struggles, Father, or faced with needs, or faced with death, or faced with whatever it is, Father, help us to see the bigger picture. Help us to work through it and walk with you through it so that your name may be That when we're unfaithful, Father, you remain faithful. You can't be anything but. We thank you for that. We give you all the honor, all the glory, all the praise. Bless you. I didn't know what the time would be. And Brian, come on up. Jump in. Now I'm going to put you all. I'm going to put you on the spot. Big time. I want you to pray for Alexander. As you, yeah, this has been since since December. Yeah. And um, you guys know that Alexander went to Africa and he got hit with malaria twice, and then he got hit big time when he was back and in the states. And with Deanna's testimony on Thursday and her healing of hepatitis C. And I had, it was around the same time when uh, Naomi was born. And he talked to the doctor in the hospital. And I knew then in the hospital room, I want that girl to pray for Alexander and his blood. Because he still has some challenges. And so just, um, to just put, play some prayer songs for me. Maybe you get something going there if you got it. If you got it there. And just, this is now the time. Okay. I want you to pray for him. For his blood. Alright? Pray. Just, just be. Just, yeah, go ahead. Thank you.
word I get from this message this morning is to wait. And, you know, you've got the Deanna story, you've got Alexandra's story, we've all got a story. And I want to finish the service here this morning finishing the prayer that I began to pray. I didn't know why I was praying that from Isaiah while we were worshiping. But it goes on to say that Isaiah chapter 40, it's why do you say, Jacob, why do you speak Israel? And I guess we could personalize that. We think, well, there's Alexander in Africa, there's Deanna with her testimony, there's Pastor Rick, there's this person, that person. No, there's Lazarus. And like Alexander said, this story isn't about Lazarus. It's about the glory of God. And we're all children of God. He's no respecters of person. He's no respecter of persons. And he knows us all by name. And I would say, why do you say Jacob? Why do you speak Israel? Why do you say Kathy? Why do you say Rachel? Why do you say Rebecca? Why do you say Jordan and Michael? Why do you say, my way is hidden from the Lord. My just claim passed over by my God. Or I would personalize, I'm not Alexander. I'm not Deanna. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. He neither faints, nor is he weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, to those who have the might. He increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, but those who wait upon the Lord, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not grow faint. Who? But those who wait upon the Lord. Father, take these words we've heard this morning. Take the words we've sung and make them a prayer that great is the Lord in all of our lives. And we will wait upon 